The enthusiast mechanical keyboard hobby is complicated. There is so much to learn from parts, mods, jargon, accessories, and more. There are learning resources like Keyboard University or beginner's guide videos like Christopher Yee's, but these mostly tackle the technical side of the hobby. I want to go over some of the lessons that you can't necessarily learn from a Google search, the kinds of things that come with experience. Sound good? Okay, let's begin with Lesson 1, Preference versus Performance. This video idea was born of a Twitter interaction between keyboard content creators Andy Nguyen and Glarses. Andy lamented the repeated requests for recommendations between different switches and different keyboards, pointing out that the answer would differ between people. Glars has astutely pointed out that people come into the hobby with a performance mindset, when they should have a preference mindset. A lot of beginners will ask questions like, what's the best switch for gaming? Or can you recommend me a keyboard for FPS gaming? And these are questions with no answers. You can game on any switch, on any keyboard. You can game on membranes, on laptops. Getting a mechanical keyboard is not going to instantly improve your gaming performance. Of course, there are factors that can affect your performance when using a mechanical keyboard for gaming, but these are all down to preference as well. Switch weight is a major one. The common advice is to get a switch with light actuation force. Some may prefer this so that they don't get tired too easily from repeatedly pressing keys, but others may prefer their switches heavy to avoid accidental key presses. Enthusiast mechanical keyboards revolve around three sought-after pillars. Sound, feel, and aesthetics. And these are all preference-based. What sounds good to one person may not necessarily sound good to another. Same with feel and aesthetic. None of these factors are essential to the functioning of a keyboard. They're just really nice to have. And that's pretty much the essence of the custom mechanical keyboard hobby. Lesson 2. The sheer cost of it all. This is kind of a recurring meme in the hobby. People will repeatedly joke about how empty their wallets are, how they resorted to eating only noodles and crackers in order to save up for keyboard parts. And it's not just memes, it's true. This is a very expensive hobby, and you can expect to have your sense of what's cheap get warped over time. My first keyboard build cost me around 100 US dollars in total including switches and keycaps, but not including the lube and other modding gear. We'll talk about that later. For the hobby, this is pretty cheap. There are pre-built keyboards from gaming brands that are more expensive. At the time, I really didn't want to spend any more than that. But now, I'm typing on a keyboard that overall costs around 250 US dollars. And it never really dawned on me how much this thing cost until my girlfriend asked me, and I was forced to add up the cost for all of the parts. And this is what I would consider a budget keyboard now. I touched on two concepts on my review of the KBD67 Lite, Lasan and the Curse. Lasan is a Filipino word, meaning poison. It's how the local enthusiasts describe getting sucked into the hobby and getting their wallets bled dry. The Curse is something I coined. It describes the cycle of discovering an experience that's more high-end than one you were previously just fine with causing you to be unable to go back. To understand this better, let's take a trip through my mechanical keyboard journey. Before 2019, I didn't really even know what a mechanical keyboard was. I'd heard of them, sure, but I never went out of my way to learn more. I used cheap membranes and laptop keyboards, and I had zero issues with them. I didn't want anything more. And then my keyboard broke, and I went researching for a new one to buy. And that was the beginning of the end. I bought a cheap, pre-built mechanical keyboard from a gaming brand with clicky switches for around 35 US dollars. This was actually kind of expensive since I was used to getting membranes for under 6 US dollars. I fell totally in love with that pre-built. I could not go back to membranes. I seriously loved the way that thing sounded, and I used it for over a year with no issues. And then I started digging deeper into the hobby, breaking into the enthusiast space. I got so obsessed and I wanted a custom so badly. So I built the 100 US dollar keyboard that I described earlier. It featured a bunch of cheap parts and amateur modding by me, but I loved that thing. Suddenly my clicky pre-built sounded awful. I could not go back. The next thing I upgraded were switches. I went from around 27 cents per switch to around 77 cents per switch. And the more expensive switches just exposed how scratchy and rattly the cheaper ones were. Once again. I couldn't go back. And now, I'm typing on the KBD67 Lite, a 109 US dollar keyboard kit, up from my previous one costing around 42 US dollars. 
and the sound disparity between these two is just enormous. Say it with me, I could not go back. Lesson three, hidden costs. Yep, lesson three is about money too. So I described my two keyboard builds in terms of a dollar value, but that's not actually all I spent on them. There are tools and miscellaneous parts that you may fail to account for. Lubing plays a huge part in making customs feel and sound as good as they do. And it's hard to include them in the price since you buy a certain volume or weight of the stuff, but you don't use it all on just one build. And the same is true for the tools that you use when lubing and modding. And it's not obvious which ones you will even really need. Some of it is optional, but will help speed up and simplify the process. But you can't really know which ones will do this for you until you try them. For example, to go along with my first build, I bought a full lubing kit. This included an acrylic lubing station. It had spots for the switch housings as well as for the switch stems. But I found that I didn't like using the spots for the stems. I prefer just picking them out of a tub and holding them with a stem holder. So half of that lubing station was pretty much useless to me. I'd have been better off with a station that was entirely composed of slots for the housings. But of course, there was no way for me to know this beforehand. Here are just some of the parts and tools that could potentially become hidden costs for you. Stabilizers, springs, lube, paintbrushes, tweezers, syringes, lube stations, switch openers, switch pullers, and keycap pullers. And you also have to be prepared to get sucked into the world of accessories. Desk mats, custom cables with coils and fancy connectors, wrist rests, and artisan keycaps, among others. And these can get pretty expensive. Of course, none of these are necessary, but they're very nice and you will see them a lot and you will get tempted. Lesson four, the group buy paradigm's side effects. The hobby pretty much revolves around the group buy paradigm. You can think of it as like a pre-order or a crowdfunding campaign. You pay for the product within a small window of time, days usually, and then it gets made, and then you get it months or years after. This has a few side effects. It can lead to impulse buys due to FOMO or fear of missing out. Some of these products do run again in the future, but there really are no guarantees of that, and it could be years down the line before they do. And so the thinking can become, I'm going to seriously regret missing out on this, which can be pretty dangerous, especially with how expensive keyboard parts can get. This is compounded by the unfortunate fact that there are just not a lot of in-stock options. The situation with that is steadily improving though. Another side effect is that you can't completely know what you're getting until you get it. Keyboard makers will often send out prototypes in advance to content creators so that they can put out reviews and initial impressions to guide consumers. But of course, prototypes will differ from the final product. And a reviewer's impressions won't always match up with the consumer's own preferences. I guess you can say that about any product, but the wait times in the keyboard hobby really exacerbate this. Lesson five, tinkering takes time. Building a custom mechanical keyboard takes a lot of time and work. You will have to decide for yourself whether you're okay with investing that time and effort. Lubing switches is a notoriously time-intensive, labor-intensive, and mind-numbingly repetitive process. Expect to spend anywhere between three hours and eight, depending on the number of switches, what parts of the switch specifically you lube, and how fast you can lube. And there's also the process of tuning stabilizers. I ranted about this in my KBD67 Lite review. Stabs can be really hard to get right, but they're absolutely essential to a good sounding keyboard. There are all manner of mods and hacks floating around the hobby for getting your stabilizers to sound and feel just right. For non-hot swap custom keyboards, you will also have to solder. Fortunately, hot swap has become very prevalent. I myself have never soldered a keyboard, although I did solder a bunch in college. I didn't like it, which is why I'm delaying soldering anything keyboard related as much as I can. I think that it is viable nowadays to be a keyboard enthusiast and never solder, although I have so far only explored the low end of keyboards. All of this tinkering can be technically avoided by paying others to do it for you. Of course, that adds to the cost, but it is a viable option if you don't have the interest or patience to tinker and are willing to shell out the money. Personally, I consider the tinkering to be part of the fun of the hobby. Lesson six, crowd preferences. There's a bit of a contradiction in the keyboard community. People will repeatedly remind you that it's all about preference. 
But then there are certain preferences that are constantly ridiculed. I'm sure some of it is all in good fun, but sometimes I have a hard time telling when it is. To possibly save you from some of this grief, I'll be outlining some of these crowd preferences. I'd like to stress again that these are all personal preferences. Liking or disliking any of this is completely valid. You should not feel ashamed for having any of these preferences, but you will probably get shamed for expressing them. Number one, clicky switches. Technically, there are three types of mechanical key switch, linear, tactile, and clicky. But in the enthusiast space, clickies are generally pretty disliked and disregarded. Number two, Cherry MX Browns. This has been kind of a meme for a while now, and it was taken to a whole new level by our man, Glarses. Hating on MX Browns is kind of his thing. The general reason I've seen for the hate is that the tactile bump of these tactile switches is so small that it's almost non-existent, which makes people think, what's the point? Number three, pre-built keyboards. Boards from brands like Razer, SteelSeries, and Corsair are a favorite punching bag for the community. There's nothing inherently wrong with these keyboards, they're just made for a different market. With these keyboards, you will have a very hard time chasing the three pillars of sound, feel, and aesthetics. And that's simply because these keyboards were not designed with that in mind. I guess aesthetics would be the easiest if all you want to do is change out keycaps. Number four, RGB. This one's closely related to the previous one. Gaming keyboards will often tout RGB as a key feature. Enthusiasts don't care about RGB as much since they generally use keycaps and keyboards that don't show it off all that well. RGB also has a reputation for being garish and tacky, like the stereotype gamer aesthetic as a whole. Number five, Thok. When enthusiasts describe the sound of a key press, they generally use one of two words, thok and clack. These refer to the pitch of the key press. Thok is low and clack is high. From my own observations, thok is the more widely sought after pitch. Unfortunately for me, I feel like I've lost the ability to discern pitch. These days, what matters to me is just that it sounds good, regardless of whether it thoks or it clacks. And that's it. Six lessons. I know this had kind of a negative vibe, like there's so much to watch out for, but if you can afford it, if you're ready to chase after those pillars, if you're okay with tinkering, this is a very enjoyable, fulfilling, and exciting hobby. What's that? You, you wanna get poisoned? Well, I guess you're ready. So you've got options. Check out the Mechanical Keyboard subreddit to see people's unique, beautiful, and probably very expensive keyboards. If you want to treat your ears to some clean, crisp, nutty goodness, there are tons of sound tests on YouTube. Start with Teha types. There are also Facebook groups dedicated to the hobby where you can meet and interact with fellow enthusiasts. You can also check out Instagram for more keyboard photography. And on Twitch, there are a lot of streamers who build keyboards on stream. I hope you found this video helpful. If you did, please consider leaving a like and subscribing to the channel if you haven't already. If there's anything you think that I got wrong, or if there's a lesson that I missed, please sound off in the comments. I may do a part two of this if there's enough interest and in material. Thank you so much for watching.